Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's Leo lecture, timely talks that offer innovation and inspiration from Hamlin thought leaders. Uh, I'm Molly Glevy from the Alumni Relations Office, and I'm really pleased that you've joined us today. I should mention that we are celebrating Hamlin's homecoming and alumni weekend a little early today. So if you're interested in other Leo lectures, we've got some great videos planned, different things like that. You can find all of that information at hamlin.edu backslash alumni weekend. And one other thing before we get started with some housekeeping things and introduce our speaker. This session is being recorded. So if you need to step away or if you have friends or family who you think might be interested, uh, it will be up online just in a, a few days. So you can find it on our website if you'd like to find it later. And with that, I'm going to give a bit of information and then introduce Professor Peterson, who will be presenting on the Violence Project, Understanding Mass Shootings in America. You will be muted and your camera will be off for today's presentation. If you have a question for our speaker, please use the Q&A icon in your Zoom dashboard on your screen. And I should note, Professor Peterson will take questions at the end of today's talk. But if you have questions throughout, just go ahead and put them in the Q&A section and uh, you don't need to wait till the end to submit that question. If you have a question about the logistics of today's webinar, please use the chat icon. We have a few people who are here to troubleshoot if we need to. And then finally, please be patient with us. As you can imagine, we are presenting from homes, offices. You could hear pets, kids, lawnmowers. Uh, I will tell you that here in the Alumni House, I, I wish we were prepping name tags for hundreds of alums to come to campus this weekend, but I feel so thankful that we were able to do this and we've got faculty members who are ready to join us. So with that, I will introduce Professor Peterson, who is an Associate Professor of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Hamlin. She has a master's degree and a PhD in psychology and social behavior from the University of California, Irvine and a bachelor's degree in sociology from Grinnell. Prior to graduate school, Professor Peterson worked as a mitigation specialist in Chicago and New York City, investigating the psychosocial life histories of men facing the death penalty for their sentencing hearings. Oops, there we go. She has worked as a research coordinator at the University of Minnesota, as a consultant and a forensic psychology trainer. She has published multiple articles on offenders with mental illness, risk assessment, psychopathy and school shootings. Her areas of expertise include forensic psychology, mental illness in the criminal justice system, research methods and statistics, and violent crime. And with that, I'm going to hand my screen over to Professor Peterson. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see, let me get my screen shared here. All right, can you see this? Okay, I'm assuming you can. Yes, um, you are good. All right, so I'm gonna be talking today about this project that began in 2017, so three years ago now. And it started out just kind of a passion project with me and my research partner, James Densley, and then a group of Hamlin undergrad students. And it was when we, mass shootings were in the news a lot. It was right around the 2017 Las Vegas shooting that we were getting started. Um, my background as a psychologist is I'm really interested in where violence comes from and how violence develops over the life course. And there was all this conversation about mental illness and mass violence. And when I went to look, I really couldn't find any information on it um, in terms of what percentage of shooters actually have mental illness? Um, what are their life histories like? What are their childhoods like? And realize that the information just didn't exist. So we started working, me and these students, it started out with about 10 students. They were volunteers, not getting credit, not getting paid. Um, we made this spreadsheet of all the mass shootings we could find, and I'll talk more about how we define that, and then just started filling it in with any information that we could find. And the project kind of grew, um, more and more students joined. 
Um, it got a lot of media attention. And then I applied for a grant from the US Department of Justice. It was a $300,000 grant to support the work. And we were thrilled when we got that grant, which allowed us to not only now pay the students who were working on the project, but also really expand the work in new ways, which I'll talk about. So first, some context. Um, this is the crime rate, the violent crime rate is the red lines. You can see it has been falling um, pretty consistently since the 90s. We are at um, sort of as low of a point as we've ever been. There's some blips in there, but generally we're on a downward slope. But if you see fear of crime, that's that black line. And you can see that those two split and open into that kind of alligator mouth right around 2001. Um, so if you were in my class, I would say, what happened that year? Um, but it was 9-11. So right around 9-11, that's where you see our fear and perceptions of crime really elevating while the crime rate continued to fall. Also, the Columbine High School shooting was right then in 1999, which also contributed. And so we are now at the point um, where many people have a fear of mass shootings. It's about six in 10 report being actively afraid of mass shootings. 21% of people have skipped public events back when there were public events um, because they were afraid that a mass shooting might take place. And also just for context to put mass shootings in the context of all gun violence. So this is data from 2017, which is really the last year we have good data. It takes a couple years for it to come in. If you look at suicide by gun, um, that accounts for about 24,000 deaths. That's about 60% of people who die from a gun do so by suicide. And that tends to be white males who are over 50. Um, then you have what we call criminal homicides, 14 to 15,000 a year. Um, that is typically black men, 18 to 34, who are the victims. Um, then you have domestic violence. These are harder to track. Um, this is typically women who are killed by their partners. One to 2,000 people die a year. And then you have mass shootings, which gets a lot of our sort of energy and time and headspace. Um, and 2017 was actually a horrifically bad year. It was the worst year on record because of the Las Vegas shooting and 117 people died. Um, so mass shootings are rare events. When we talk about gun violence, they are a very small proportion of gun violence, um, but they have become routine and they're what we call focusing events. So when they happen, um, they really grip everybody and that have huge impact. So in this study, um, it's actually really important to be clear about how you're defining a mass shooting because depending how you define it, you can say that we've had one so far in 2020, or you can say we've had over a thousand, depending on the definition that you're using. Um, we used what is the FBI's definition, which is the definition that the US Department of Justice wanted us to use, which was four more people who are killed with a gun within one event, um, and we define that as within 24 hours, at a public location, so that means not ones that occur in homes, and the murders are not attributable to any underlying criminal activity or commonplace circumstance. So that would rule out things like um, robberies gone bad. So this definition does not include domestic mass shootings, which are called family annihilations, and which is typically when a man kills his wife and children and then himself. Those are the most common form of mass shootings, and so if you include those, um, the database would nearly double in size. And we actually currently are working on adding those into the database. But the data I'm talking about today doesn't include those. So our research, um, the database is now finished. So we um, just finished it in uh, July. Um, so it's been about two and a half years. It is now completely publicly available. So if you go to thebryantsproject.org, you can request the database. Um, and it'll be automatically sent to you as an Excel file. It's been downloaded, I think, two or 3,000 times so far. Um, and part of what we wanted to do was make this data available to policymakers, to journalists, to academics, to students, to anybody who is interested, because in order to really push policy forward and to really start preventing things, you need the data to understand why it's happening. So our hope was that by pushing this data out, 
and grounding our public policy conversations in this data um, that we would be able to move forward in a more positive direction. It includes 166 different variables. Um, that's everything from early childhood, mental health, um, what happened before the crime, crisis points. We included an entire gun database. So every single gun, this was one student's summer research project, every single gun that was used in a mass shooting since 1966 um, is individually coded in terms of um, where they got it, what time of gun it was, when they bought it. Um, we also have a victims database that goes through every victim. We have a community database that looks at sort of community level factors, things like um, like percentage of rental units or how many mental health providers are in the zip code or how many different gun stores, things like that. And we coded the data using open source data. So anything that was publicly available was fair game. So that was primary sources. So things like manifestos, um, social media posts, interview transcripts, and mostly we use things like media, court transcripts, law enforcement records. It's amazing what's actually publicly available for a lot of these mass shooters because their crimes get so much media attention that you can get things like school records and medical records. Um, yes, and so every, um, every cell in the database, if you download the database, every single cell is linked so you can see exactly where we got the information. Um, and so that lets people kind of double check or we've had people respond and say, hey, I think this cell might be off, I think, or this link is broken. So that's a way we keep it kind of this living, breathing document. We also conducted interviews. Um, and so this was what we were able to do when we got the NIJ funding. So we started out um, writing to every living incarcerated mass shooter um, that we could locate. So the database right now has 174 mass shooters who meet that definition. In terms of how many were actually living and incarcerated when we started the project, it was around 30, 35, um, because most of them die on the scene. So we sent recruitment letters basically just saying, we're doing the study, we're not interested in your crime, we're interested in your life leading up to the crime. We're interested in understanding sort of how people get to the point of doing this so we can prevent others from doing it. And to our surprise, we had seven perpetrators write us back and say that they wanted to be a part of the study. Um, we were not able to interview them in person, but we were able to do a series of phone interviews and letters. So we actually had seven perpetrators who we were talking to, and those served as really our case studies, our qualitative case studies. And then we also did a lot of interviews in the community. Um, so we spoke to perpetrators, mothers, fathers, sisters, uncles, childhood friends. We also talked to victims and victims' parents, to FBI investigators, to teachers who survived mass shootings. And this involved traveling around the country uh, pre-COVID and doing these really in-depth, in-person interviews. We would kind of go to a community where a mass shooting had happened and interview as many people as we could. And this was mostly me and um, my co-investigator, James Densley, but we also brought students with us into the field. And so we had two students who would accompany us on these trips and actually get the experience of doing these interviews. So what did we find? Um, this is sort of still context, but this is the number of mass shootings over time. So it has been increasing. Um, the worst year on records were 2017, 2018, and 2019. Now they've really disappeared, and I'll talk about COVID's impact at the end and what we think that means. Um, and also, in addition to just becoming more frequent, they've also been getting more deadly. So we have more people um, dying within each shooting. And if you look at the most deadly shootings um, that we have, and this is going back to 1966, which I should say that is the uh, Texas Bell Tower shooting, which is kind of thought to be the first modern day mass shootings. There were mass shootings that happened before that, but in this case, um, the perpetrator climbed to the top of the Texas Bell Tower, started firing down and local television crews showed up and ended up um, 
playing it live on TV. So that became sort of known as the first modern day mass shooting. Um, I should also say I don't use perpetrator names uh, when I talk about mass shooting. That is because there is a movement called No Notoriety that was started by a couple who lost their son in the Aurora, Colorado shooting. Um, and that's a couple that we interviewed. And they are really adamant at that if we keep sort of names out of the media and take away the notoriety, that will have an impact. So when I talk about mass shootings, I only say the perpetrator. Um, so if you look at the deadliest shootings, it's most of them you have been in relatively recent years. So we've got Las Vegas, Orlando, Newtown, Sutherland Springs, El Paso, Parkland. This is by location. So what's interesting is I don't think we tend to think of workplace shootings as the most common form of mass shootings, but we divided them into these nine categories. And if you see workplace is the most common, followed by retail and restaurants, um, outdoor spaces. We did include residents if it was some sort of party. Um, and then K-12 school shootings, university and colleges, um, and churches and house of worship are actually less common. But over time, we've seen workplace shootings going down where things like house of worship shootings are going up. This is um, by region, so most common in the South and in the West. The West is heavily driven by the state of California. They have the most mass shootings. Um, and you can see it's about 50% urban, 25% suburban, 25% rural. So in terms of who the mass shooters are, um, they are 98% male. So there is four females in the database. Um, I think only one who committed a mass shooting without a male partner on her own. Um, so largely male, and this is, um, it's striking, but also if you look at any form of homicide, it's over 90% male, and I could teach a whole semester class on why that is. Um, if you look at race, this surprises some people. So it is majority white. It's about 52% of perpetrators are white, 20% black, 8% Latinx, 6% Asian, 4% Middle Eastern. Um, this does differ by location. So K to 12 school shooters are closer to 80% white, whereas college and university shooters are only 33% white. Um, and this just gives you some sort of um, top level look at some of the things we coded and I'm touching on just a few of them here. 15% um, were immigrants. Nearly 29% had a military history, which is much higher than the general population. Most had a prior criminal history. Most had a history of violence. Um, nearly 30% had a history of domestic violence. We also looked at violent video games. That was a variable we added recently after that started getting a lot of attention, only about 14% bullied. And then in crisis is one I'm gonna go a little more deeply into. So we looked at whether a perpetrator was in crisis and we defined a crisis as a noticeable change in behavior um, in the days, weeks or months prior to the shooting. So something changed that people noticed and they were acting differently. And it's typically when your current situation overwhelms your ability to cope. Um, and so we tried to break down um, kind of recent stressors, depressed mood, mood swings. You can see increased agitation was really common. And the vast majority, 80% of perpetrators had some sort of crisis sign. And you can see nearly 40% had five or more different crisis signs. So they were acting very different um, and that other people around them were noticing. And so this is an important finding when we're talking about prevention. And I should say, I didn't, do much with methodology, but for the entire database, what we did is every single perpetrator was coded by two separate students. Those were compared, and then any coding that didn't match was looked at more closely. Then we had them all coded by a third student to triple check, and then before we released, we had another student sort of do a fourth check on every single cell. So it went through about four iterations to make sure that we were reliable. <clears throat> 
Um, I'm a psychologist in the criminal justice department. I consider myself a forensic psychologist and I teach a class on mental illness in the criminal justice system. And so I was very interested in kind of the rates of mental illness among perpetrators. So we found about 20% had been previously hospitalized for psychiatric reasons, about 30% um, had been in counseling, but a quarter had been on some sort of psychiatric medication. And that is, th those numbers are pretty consistent with the general population, the medication. Um, family history was actually really hard to code. We had a lot of missing data, but roughly 17% we could find. Um, and then you can see mood disorders, thought disorders, and autism spectrum disorders. Um, the thought disorders at 26% is significantly higher than the general population. So in the general population, that's more like 1%. Um, and if you collapse all those categories together, it ends up being about 70% of the sample had some sort of mental health history. But what's really important here is that just because someone has a diagnosis of a mental illness, that doesn't mean that the mental illness caused their criminal behavior. And that's actually a really important distinction. So if I have a diagnosis of depression, it doesn't mean that every single thing that I do in my life is the result of those symptoms. So in order to know what role mental illness played in the crime, we took a closer look at psychosis um, because the literature and the research will tell us that psychosis is the one symptom that can increase the potential for violence. Um, so psychosis being hallucinations and delusions and specifically command hallucinations. So um, voices telling you to commit violence are associated with a slight increase in violence. So we looked at the role of psychosis and we wanted to look at were they experiencing psychosis when they were planning the crime? Were they experiencing psychosis when they actually did the crime? And was there any other types of motivation? So this was really tricky to code. You had to look at the entire kind of history of each perpetrator and try to get at zero, one, two, or three, what role did psychosis play? So each one of these three different students did each perpetrator. And then I did the final check in going through each of these and we found that about 70% had nothing to do with psychosis. 11% um, psychosis played a small role in the crime. Eight, nine percent it played a significant role. And a 10% um, of mass shootings, you could say it was completely caused by psychosis. And so I think sometimes we get um, caught in our public policy conversations where it's we, it's this or that, it's 100% or it's nothing, it's caused by mental illness or it's not. What we found is, yes, about 20% or a fifth of mass shootings, you could say um, mental illness played a significant role, but for 80%, it didn't. Um, and so this, I guess the finding is that this is a complex um, and the role of mental illness is not straightforward. Um, what we did find was very common was suicidality. Um, so 31% of mass shooters were suicidal before their attacks, 40 were suicidal during their attacks, um, and about 60% die on the scene. And so one, it really changed my thinking, I would say this finding to understand that perpetrators, that these are suicides in addition to being horrific homicides, that the perpetrator goes into these acts not with an escape plan and not planning to make their way out. And that was pretty consistent in all the interviews that we did too with the seven perpetrators is that this was meant to be their final act and they meant to die during the shooting. And so if you think of these as suicides in addition to homicides, it kind of opens up this whole nother line of prevention um, and what we know about sewer suicide prevention, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, some other findings, 45% leaked their plans ahead of time. For school shooters, it was actually 80% leaked their plans ahead of time. So we call it leakage. Um, and that means either specifically saying what you're going to do or giving more of a generalized threat of violence. And oftentimes this was done in person. Um, sometimes it was done on social media or by text, but often in person. Um, about 27% plan significantly in advance. About 24% show interest in other mass shootings. For K through 12 school shooters, this was much higher. K through 12 school shooters tend to study other school shootings. 
um, they tend to heavily research what others have done in the past. 25% um, let behind what we call a legacy token or a manifesto, something that they want to be discovered in their death, which um, maps on to a category we call fame seeking mass shooters, where they really, they do the shooting so that they will be known in their death and the way they weren't known in life. And so um, seeking out that fame, leaving behind this manifesto becomes part of their motivation. Then speaking of motivation, so these were our motivation categories that we came up with. Um, and this was going through and kind of qualitatively looking at motivation and then trying to collapse those into categories and working with students on that and then going through and recoding. Um, and this I would say is the most comprehensive database that we have on mass shooters and especially looking at motivation. So what you'll see here, divided it into three categories. So 1960 to 1999, 2000 to 2015, and then the last five years. Um, so the green arrows mean that it's gone down. So that would be employment issues, legal issues, and misogyny. We're seeing fewer mass shootings motivated by that. The yellow arrows, it's remained even. Um, so interpersonal issues, psychosis has actually been fairly steady over time, domestically motivated mass shootings um, and relationship issues. One thing that was surprising about domestic mass shootings is actually a lot of house of worship shootings are domestic, um, which I hadn't thought of, but it a lot of them are motivated because the perpetrator knows that their wife or girlfriend will be at church on Sunday morning and that there won't be security and that's a place that they can access her. Um, then if you look at the ones that are on the rise, it is ones driven by racism, ones driven by fame seeking, and then religious hate. Um, there's lots of theories about why that is, but part of one big theory is that as um, the rhetoric in this country and at, around things like racism as, and religious hatred has intensified and become more public, it has empowered um, some of these online chat groups that really facilitate violence. Um, guns, I won't go too much into. Handguns are the most commonly used gun. They're used in 56% of shootings. Assault weapons is 20%, which is much higher than used in general homicides. Um, and then you've got about 12% rifles, 11% shotguns. Um, it's actually really hard to track exactly how people got their guns. Um, we got data for about 80% of them and it's a pretty even, it's mostly legal purchases um, and then some illegal purchases. And if you go into the database, you can really go in to see all the different types of illegal purchasing categories. Um, school shooters, 80% of them are taking their parents' guns because they're not old enough to buy them. So after kind of analyzing the database and then conducting all of these different interviews, this was kind of the um, sort of map, um, the four steps that we found to be pretty common amongst all mass shooters, that it seemed to be no matter which location or kind of what your motivation, these four things were the four commonalities. So first being early childhood trauma, this was hard to get using publicly available records. We got it where we could um, in every interview we did um, with no exceptions. There was really significant early childhood trauma. Um, a lot of parental suicide, a lot of violence, a lot of um, child abuse, sexual, physical, so really um, extreme forms of early childhood trauma. Second is that crisis point that we talked about that nearly all mass shooters face where they are in crisis and this is often a suicidal crisis. Third, we call this kind of social proof. Um, Perpetrators of mass shootings follow a script. They study each other to see what others have done. Um, a lot of them get radicalized online. Um, so some of them have even talked to each other before they've done it. Um, and so 
And they also tend to cluster. So one happens and then typically two or three more happen quickly. And they're sort of copycats or people get inspired by the level of attention that they get. And so there's this sort of sociological thing happening um, where when one happens, they keep happening. Um, some mass shooters even try to kind of one up each other and there's like horrible websites where people keep track of body counts and things. So there's this um, sort of terrible social media internet phenomenon that is driving this. And then fourth, you have opportunity, which means you have access to the place where you want to commit the shooting and access to guns. And so we can think about prevention at each of these four stages. And a lot of our prevention and intervention strategies up till this point have been at that stage four opportunity, where we really think about things like let's make it harder to access the target let's put in increased security and let's put up cameras and let's put up bulletproof glass um and then a lot of conversations about access to guns and opportunity is a really critically important spot to intervene absolutely um but there also are these three other steps where intervention is possible and so thinking about how do you intervene at the trauma stage? How do you intervene with crisis? How do you intervene with the radicalization online? That all becomes an important part of the policy conversation. So for implications, um, one thing that I think is important when we talk about preventing mass shootings is there is a diffusion of benefits to all of this. So I think it's hard to measure when you're preventing a mass shooting. It's actually impossible to measure when you're really preventing a mass shooting. And they are fairly rare events. But the public policy implications of this data would have broader benefits, I believe, than just preventing mass shootings. So it would also impact things like suicides and self-harm. It would also impact other forms of homicide um, or things like substance use and other kind of maladaptive outcomes. So the thought is that by implementing some of these interventions, you're not just preventing mass shootings, you're kind of increasing holistic mental health across the board. So a few of the policy um, implications that came out of this study. One is that 80% of school shooters get their guns from family. Um, and so research shows that secure storage policies can do things like prevent suicide, prevent accidental shootings, and we also think it would prevent mass shootings. Um, most gun or owners don't safely secure their firearms. And so part of what we need is really, I think, a public health campaign around the importance of state storage. They've been doing that in California. They've also been doing things like handing out gun locks and gun lockers, which can cost $200 and making sure families know how to use them. Um, another implication is around that social proof. And are we, um, as a society kind of feeding this problem. So you can look at what we call the culture of fear over time and whether it was, you know, nuclear attacks or serial killers or childhood kidnappings or terrorist attacks. There often is something in society that's really driving a lot of fear and ends up pushing public policy. And today it really is around school shootings and mass shootings. Um, and so as a result, we've been doing things like running kids through active shooter drills in Minnesota. They go through 10 active shooter or lockdown drills a year and more and more information is coming out showing that they can be really damaging and that this can be traumatizing for both students and teachers that it increases fear um, and it flates their perception of risk and it makes school feel unsafe. And the other concern is that we're actually handing out the script to do this. So when we start running kids through active shooter drills when they're four years old and continue to run them through them five, six times a year until they graduate, are we saying this is a normal part of school? Are we teaching them that this is a normal thing? Um, and is could for vulnerable students that be something that becomes part of their triggering? Um, we also know that mass shooters are insiders not outsiders so this means at k through 12 schools they are students of the school at colleges and universities they are students of the college at workplaces 
they are employees of that workplace. That is That tends to be who commits a shooting. And so when we drill, are we showing people, potential perpetrators, the exact response? And so that's what we've seen with school shootings is that perpetrators of school shootings have run through so many drills that they know exactly how the school is going to respond, that they actually take that knowledge to increase the number of casualties. Um, and we also know when it's insiders and not outsiders that things like security and you know really fancy facial recognition software is not going to be effective because the person knows how to go in and out of the building. Um, so school security is right now a two billion dollar industry. I think in Minnesota we gave out like 30 million last year to increase doors um, to our schools, which again, if they're insiders, not outsiders, that money is not being effectively spent. Uh, we know that most mass shooters are suicidal and in crisis. So punishing threats of violence with things like excluding, um, firing, expelling, criminally charging people who threaten violence actually can only exacerbate their feelings of crisis, it can increase their grievances, it can make them more hopeless, more suicidal, and actually increases the odds that violence is gonna occur. Um, so when we see someone threaten violence, um, our data would say we should see that more as a cry for help, more of someone saying that they are in crisis and actively suicidal, and rather than criminally charge, intervene with appropriate resources. Um, so I am personally a huge advocate of evidence-based crisis intervention and suicide prevention training. Um, so crisis intervention is a skill. Um, this is a skill that I'm currently teaching right now to my students who are in my mental illness class. Um, that the idea that I use is that a person in crisis is like a balloon that's ready to pop and all you need to do for someone is let a little bit of air out when they're in that state. And there is very tangible ways to do that non-verbally, verbally with the space, things that you can say and do that can really help someone let a little bit of air out so they can get through that moment. And that doesn't mean they don't need long-term intensive intervention, but getting someone through a crisis point is something that we should all be trained to be doing. And I would say, especially as we are reopening society and that kids are returning to schools and people are returning to campus and workplaces, really emphasizing that crisis intervention skill will be really important. Um, we know that many shooters leak their plans ahead of time and um, warn people or say things. And it's hard because we've talked to parents who said like, yeah, I was worried that this would happen. I did, I was worried that he would do something like this, but I'm not gonna go and call the police on my own kid, or I can't go, you know, report something that didn't already happen. And so there has been an increase in these anonymous reporting systems. So this is P3 campus. And you can literally just um, anonymously say that you saw this thing on social media that you're worried about, or you heard this person say this. It goes to this crisis center in Florida um, that has 24 seven staff with really highly trained crisis counselors um, that immediately text you back within a minute and try to gather information and then make a plan for intervention, whether that is contacting the school, whether it's contacting law enforcement, whether that's kind of doing nothing, but trying to sort of assess and figure out how to intervene. So this is run through Sandy Hook Promise. And I think they're in four or five states now, but the hope is that this would expand. And this also maps onto, I think, current calls for crisis responders or mental health responders, kind of somebody to call who's not law enforcement, but who could be trained in a crisis response. Um, also, we know that cultures of care are really important. And I think part of um, sort of the education piece that I've had to do with this data is thinking about how do we convince people that school safety and public safety is cultures of care, is warm, welcoming environments, that creating schools that have metal detectors and armed police officers is not actually making you safer. What would be more safe is having schools with really strong, healthy relationships between adults and kids where kids feel like they can report, 
where adults are going to notice when somebody's in crisis or something that's something is off where people trust each other that if they're going to disclose information it's not going to be responded to in the wrong way same thing you can build those um, in workplaces or in churches or in communities so how do we create these really warm cultures of care that facilitate intervention um, and this is uh, one of my favorite stories. So this is a piece that gives me a lot of hope with this. And we interviewed three people who had planned to do a mass shooting and change their mind. Um, one of whom actually went to school with the gun in his backpack and didn't end up taking it out. And when we would talk to them about why, what stopped them, it was always a human connection. It was always somebody connecting and giving them a little bit of hope. Um, this man has a TED talk and you can watch it. It's really powerful, but he talks about how he was planning to commit a school shooting at his school and it was gonna happen the next day. He was dead set on it. He planned to die in the shooting and he went over to his friend's house and his friend's mom had baked him a blueberry pie just because he was coming over there. And that fact that she had baked him a pie and it was just for him was just enough to let some air out of that balloon to get him through that moment, to give him a little bit of hope that somebody cares. And so I think sometimes these public policy changes when we think about gun laws or access to mental health treatment um, or counselors in schools, it feels so big and massive. And we talk about childhood trauma and online chat groups, it all can feel really overwhelming. But when it gets down to getting someone through a moment and getting them past that point, it really is just connection with another human and you don't even know when you're doing it. So it's hard to know um, how powerful that can be sometimes. Um, lastly, I just want to touch on COVID-19. So what we've seen since March is that mass shootings have essentially stopped, um, which I guess is one positive outcome from this. Um, and mainly that's because there's no opportunity. Um, so we're not gathering in mass, we're not going to schools, we're staying at home. And so the big question right now is, will they stay down or will they come back? Um, and there's kind of two lines of thought about that. So one theory is that we now, mass shootings are out of the news, we're not talking about them, um, we're not running through active shooter drills all day long. They're not on the front page of our newspapers or across our television screens. It might be fading um, from our kind of public consciousness. And that might be enough to let them fade away. Um, we also have a new common enemy, which is this virus that we're all very focused on and taking very seriously. And we saw this after 9-11 um, school shooting stopped for a few years after 9-11, then they did eventually come back. The other theory um, that maybe has a bit more, I don't know, who knows, uh, but the other theory is that a lot of risk factors are building right now. And so people are at home. We have a lot of kids who are in violent households or households where they're experiencing more trauma. We have things like job loss. Um, and stress, which we know increases, family violence increases, frustration. Um, people are spending more and more time on the internet, which can be in darker places. And there's just been some big studies coming out that we know mental health symptoms, feelings of depression and suicidality specifically for 18 to 25 year olds are the highest they've ever been. Um, this new CDC study found that 25% of 18 to 25 year olds had considered suicide in the last 30 days. So we know that mental health people aren't doing well. And we also know that we have a record gun sales. Um, it was already record high after March and then after all of the protests and things this summer. Um, I can't remember the numbers, 2 million or something, but it's the most firearm sales that we've had in since we've started tracking it. And so the other worry is that this is kind of a perfect storm as we start picking up, that we have to be really careful about things like crisis intervention and paying attention to mental health in addition to just our physical health. So I'm gonna stop there and answer some questions. Um, this is my email address, feel free to email me. That's my Twitter. 
Um, we, I just finished writing a book that is called The Violence Project with Abrams Press, and that will be coming out in 2021. Okay, Jillian, I'm going to send some questions your way. Um, and before I get to the questions in the Q&A, and, and like I said before, please go ahead and drop those in as you'd like. I've, I have a question, and yeah. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about uh, what it's been like, any coaching, mentoring you need to do with your undergrad students who are doing this work and doing it over long periods of time and um, how that sort of impacted your, maybe your teaching style or your, your work together. Mm -hmm. I personally love working with undergraduate students on research. It's a really kind of different relationship than teaching or advising because you're kind of collaborating together on this common big problem. And a lot of students would say it was the mo biggest, most important thing they did when they were at Hamlin, that it was the first time they were felt like they were part of something that was really big. Um, and then it would get all this national attention and they were incredibly proud. It was a lot of training, um, a lot of training, a lot of reliability checks. Um, and there, I probably over three years, we probably had 40 different students who worked on it in some capacity. Um, towards the end, we had, I would say, six students who worked on it for a solid two years who were really highly trained um, that would go in the field, who would manage the database. And those students, like I knew them as freshmen, and they didn't have the self-confidence. They didn't see themselves as researchers, and they came out of this experience as just these really confident rock stars. And many of them are going on to graduate school. We have one who just entered a super prestigious criminology PhD program coming out of this project. So it was amazing to kind of see their development as the pro project developed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, here, is, here are some questions for you. With a low percentage of deaths from mass shootings, from policy and investment standpoints, would we save more lives by focusing efforts on suicides, criminal, and domestic shootings? Um, yes, we would. Um, I think suicide in particular um, is 60% of deaths by guns, and we don't think about that as well, um, or very often. And so in terms of just pure numbers, yes, um, it would be more impactful to focus on suicides and general homicides. I think the one thing about mass shootings is that the mental health implications go far beyond the people immediately touched by them. And so because they get such national coverage, it ends up impacting all of us. Um, so even things, you know, like getting patted down before you go into a concert or all these things that we've just adapted our lives um, because of this small number of mass shootings. So they're, they have such a huge impact that I think that's why we put so much attention there, but certainly um, focusing on gun suicides and more general criminal homicides would be incredibly important. Uh, a question from a 2011 Hamlin grad who is now working as a psychiatric nurse practitioner, wondering if you could touch on the role of substance use and abuse in mass shootings. Yeah, that's a good question. So we did code that. Um, it was, and I, I want to say it, it, it was definitely an issue. Um, it came up, I want to say around 50% of the time, either alcohol or drugs and alcohol. I think alcohol was more common. Um, and we did have a number of shooters who really blamed drugs and alcohol. So two that we actually interviewed, one of them blamed kind of the drugs he was on and one of them blamed being so blackout drunk as kind of the final thing that pushed them over the edge. So we do know that's critically important. And we, when we talk about mental illness and violence, we know that substance use is kind of the key ingredient there that really um, makes that relationship stronger. So I would say we're still in the process of kind of exploring the role of substance use and um, what that means for prevention in terms of substance use treatment. What is the definition you use of assault rifle? <laughs> ha, um, I'm the wrong person to answer that. So I'm not a gun person, 
but we did work with a gun person um, who helped us develop the definition. So I, I'm sorry, I can't tell you, I could follow up, but also if you download the database, it's in there and how we defined it. And actually, let me mention now, if, if uh, Professor Peterson shared her contact information, but also if you want to email alum at hanlon.edu, if you have questions after this, we'd be happy to pass those along as well. Um, so, so you are welcome to do that. Uh, here's another question. With the divisiveness of our country, would you expect an uptick of mass shootings after the election? And you did touch on this a little bit in the context of COVID uh, after the election. Yeah, I mean, I think, I hope not, um, but certainly um, we see when there is more political divisiveness, we see when there's less trust in your leadership, we do see an uptick in violence. Um, we do know in the last four years, that's been the worst four years on record in terms of mass shooting and, and a lot of those being driven by religious hatred and racism. And so there is concern about what is going to happen after the election. You also have a lot of people who have been cooped up at home who are feeling hopeless um, and who have access to firearms. And so you mix that with this particularly divisive election. And I do think it's there's reason to be concerned. I mean, hopefully not. Um, and I think there's things we can do to prevent that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Can you talk a little bit about the variables and um, the 100, 140 or 160 variables? How did you, when did you know you had gotten, had gotten, not enough, but when did you stop looking for variables? Good question. So I think when we started out, it was about 100 that we started with, and that was going off of the literature out there, the things that get covered in the media, um, just kind of general things that we know are linked with suicide or violence. We kind of had a hundred that we knew we wanted. And actually the students were really helpful in adding in more variables. So they would say like, hey, a student was like, we're coding counseling, but we're not coding whether it was voluntary or mandated, or we're coding, um, you know, history of violence, but we're not coding specifically domestic violence. And so a lot of that actually came from student input as they were working. We also added things that got additional media attention or that we would get questions about. Um, so that's like where violent video games, um, I think it was a user suggested that we include school performance. They wanted to know if these were high functioning or low functioning. Um, like socioeconomic status, that was a recent ad. And I would say, I don't know we're done. Like, I think it could keep growing, certainly. Um, but I, now we're at the point where I feel like we really have a kind of solid grasp on these people's life histories. In some of the variables, um, there's no missing data at all. And then some of them are just harder to get with public records. So there is more missing data. Is anyone else in the country doing similar work or research? Mm -hmm. So when the US Department of Justice gave out this grant, it was specifically a call for um, mass shooting data. And they ended up giving out three. So it was us, um, Northeastern University, where Jamie Fox, who's been doing this work for a long time is, they use a slightly different uh, definition of mass shooting, you're interested in mass killings. So they include things like arson and bombs and stabbings. And then there was another group down at the University of Florida who also got the grant, who's building their own database, much more focused on the domestic mass shootings. And what was interesting is they brought all three research groups together um, for a three-day meeting in Texas. And so it was like the head of the National Institute of Justice and these three teams. And it was amazing as kind of little liberal arts Hamlin University to be at the table for that conversation because it was kind of the people doing the work. Um, and so the three teams have been exchanging information and exchanging resources and kind of keeping up with each other, but we're all doing sort of slightly different projects. Can you talk a little bit more about the leaking and the leaving of clues, um, specifically when, when that happens, is, is there an expectation? Do the perpetrators 
um, can, can, have you been able to, to determine if they expect an action taken as a result? Do they want, does that make sense? Yes. So what, right. what's the desired so outcome? Why, why would you post online that you're going to do something like this? Um, I really think that the only reason you would do that is so somebody would try and stop you. Um, so one example is the 2005 school shooting that happened at Red Lake here in Minnesota. And that perpetrator did a lot of leaking. Uh, he posted things all over the internet. He told teachers, he wrote horrific things in school papers. He drew pictures while he was sitting in class. It was so much. Um, and there was never anyone who intervened. Um, and so I think he hit a point of hopelessness um, where, he, and he did kill himself during the shooting. Um, so I think up to this point, I think the approach with leaking has been, oh, look, they're threatening violence. And that's been the FBI's approach. Like, if you are going to threaten a school shooting, we're going to consider that a terroristic threat and we're going to charge you on a felony. But from my perspective as a psychologist, you actually don't want to stop leakage. Um, leakage is actually your best opportunity for intervention. You want them to leak. If they're thinking about that, you want them to say it because then you can actually intervene before it happens. Um, and there was some, I think, previous mythology out there that there's people who talk about it and people who do it. And I've been at trainings where people talk like that. And what we found is that's not the case. People who do it actually do talk about it. Um, and so that's your opportunity. I ask one last question. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the no notoriety movement? When is that very recent? Uh, has that, do people understand it? Does, does it require a lot of explanation? Um, I think it's getting a lot more traction. So it was started by uh, a couple of the Teves. Their son was killed in the Aurora, Colorado shooting. Um, in the movie theater, he was there with his fiance and he actually jumped on top of her when it was happening and she lived and he ended up dying. And he was this remarkable um, sort of young man getting his master's degree, just starting out his life. And when their parents were getting interviewed, um, and I think it was he, the father was being interviewed on Anderson Cooper when this really was born, because he just kept showing the perpetrator's picture and kept saying the perpetrator's name. And he just hit this point where he was like, can you just for five seconds not speak that name and get that picture off the screen? Um, and he, so the dad talks about how he, every newspaper he looked at, it was his picture. Um, everywhere he went, it was just this obsession with the perpetrator and his son wasn't getting talked about. Um, and so they founded No Notoriety because realizing how many perpetrators do this for the attention and that we as the society give them that attention. And so every time we turn on the news and we click on the article or we share something on social media, we are actually driving the phenomenon. We are actually giving people what they were looking for. And so no notoriety is a set of standards for media, for researchers, for the general public to how do you talk about these crimes and think about preventing them without giving anyone notoriety that they're looking for. And it was a challenge having just written a book um, to figure out how to write that book using the no notoriety practices, but we were careful to do that. I do have one last question um, that just came in. What kind of things do potential perpetrators say or uh, clues do they give? Going back to the idea of, of leaking. Mm -hmm. You know, it's most common for it to be non-specific leakage. So things like maybe you shouldn't come to school tomorrow or, um, you know, what would you think if I killed everybody here, right? Like not something where you're saying like tomorrow at three o'clock, I'm gonna do this, um, but kind of talking about mass violence, talking about suicide, general threats of violence that in retrospect, people can say, oh yeah, he did that. It's harder in the moment to know when you should take something seriously. Um, but I think part of what we're learning is we should just be taking all of that seriously and not seriously like they should go to jail or be suspended, seriously that that's someone who really needs some intervention at that moment. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So with that, we'll wrap up today's Leah lecture. Jillian, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, and like I said, this will be online. So 
go ahead and if you have friends or fellow alums who you know would be interested in this topic, uh, we'd be happy to uh, have them access that as well. Uh, questions that you maybe had that we ran out of time or come later, like I said, email Dr. Peterson, email alum at hamlin.edu. We'd be happy to pass those along. And I hope some of you can join us for some of our future LEO lectures. So thank you again. Thank you. Thanks,